I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. Align Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. In today's episode, I've got to have someone that I've been following along for the last decade or so, Mr. Gil Headley. Gil truly will go down in history, he already has, I would say, but um, as one of the foremost pioneers of the, the happenings, the going abouts of the insides of our body, specifically around fascia and connective tissue. Um, he ha- is the uh, founder of the Integral Anatomy series, and he's been, I mean, he's like quoted and referenced in anybody that talks about anything in relation to fascia, really. So this conversation is really great. I'm super excited about it for y'all and myself. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for checking out the website, alignpodcast.com, A-L-I-G-N podcast.com. On there, you can start the five day movement challenge, um, super simple. It's like five, two minute videos or something, um, breaking down fundamental movements that I think that every single human being, um, could use in their day to day life. So you can jump on there, linepodcast.com. I also have like show notes and you know, all this stuff, online program, all the things. It's like, you know, it's, it's my website. It's got stuff. Um, I wanted to thank Cured Nutrition for supporting this podcast. I really dig those guys. They are, um, it's a CBD company, but so much more. They um, they infuse CBD into various products that I would be using anyway. So different like spices. They have like a like a hot cocoa mix with CBD in it. They're really good stuff. Um, I highly recommend checking those guys out. Um, high quality products and it's affordable. It's wild that it's actually affordable. CBD, affordable, unbelievable. Um, so you can go to curednutrition.com, use the align code to get 10% off, make it even more affordable. I'm back in Los Angeles. I've been in Costa Rica for the last month and um, it was really fun. Went, studied yoga. It was really great, good experience. Um, so I'm gonna be, man, there's events and stuff. We're gonna do events page on the website. I'm not gonna mention it here. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Here we go, back to the podcast with Gil Headley. Line podcast. The time you've spent working <clears throat> with cadavers, if that's like shifted your perspective on movement at all. It's shifted my perspective on everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's shifted. So on movement, definitely. Whoa. Starting with movement, let's, let's let's start at point A. Okay. Cadavers don't. <laughs> right. And so the stark uh, the stark contrast of the stillness of the dead and the movement of the living, if, if that alone doesn't set you on a path when you first witness it, uh, a little well. Hmm. Can you elaborate? Sure. Um, you, you know, there's this weird funhouse mirror you look into in the laboratory. There's this uncanny resemblance between your own form and what's on the table but something's really off there and what's really off is it ain't moving right and so life like what the heck is that i had a guy pressing me on facebook of all places over the last few days to get me to like define life and i'm thinking hey (laughs) that's asking a lot you know uh on facebook no less uh, give me the definition of life. What is alive? And I, I really can't, I, I can only, I can do it through negation sort of, or like, you know, you sort of, you know it when you see it for the most part, right? Like a cockroach, you know, you've never seen a cockroach in your whole life, but when first one skitters across the floor, you're like, ah, the cockroach. And life is like that too. Um, <laughs> in reverse, it's like, you've never seen something dead before. And then there's like that flat squirrel on the road. You're a little kid and you're like, oh, golly that's dead and uh you know bring that into the into the human realm and and it has its own impact now not so much for me i was raised at funeral homes i had a hundred old aunts and uncles and my mother would take me out of school and go to the 
weekly <laughs> funeral. Um, so I was pretty uh, comfortable with the, with the dead, uh, being in the presence of the dead. But um, but it's all it's, the, it's that movement thing. So no breath, no 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 flushing of the face at the joke told near the casket. Hmm. Have you explored um, Have you explored psychedelics much, or is that something that you're like open to talking about? No, I mean I talk about it if I had explored it, but I I have uh, I'm what you call a teetotaler. I I if I can't get there for my own endogenous pharmacopoeia, I ain't going. <laughs> so, yeah. Have you explored like breath work, like holotropic breathing, or any type of like stuff like that, kind of altering consciousness through? Uh, I am a New Jersey suburban boy. <laughs> <laughs> A straight A student and was a good Catholic in my day, so I yeah. didn't even, uh, you know, have a have, you know, a wild twenties sex party like y'all folks do these days. I just kind of, you know, went to the library, read my books. <laughs> I'm like a fucking straight arrow, dude. <laughs> have you had near death experiences? Um, just wanting to die count. <laughs> yeah, sure. What well, was that? Sure, I've I've been low in my life. Yeah, I've been low, and I've been brought back from those low points by wonderful experiences. And I have had prayer experiences that others might liken to psychedelic experiences. What's what would be an example of the prayer experience likened to psychedelic for you? Oh, when you're when you're hearing something read, and your mind goes there and is there, and has a three D live experience i've had that kind of thing but yeah. um i don't place a whole lot of uh value in those things to tell you the truth uh because um it's all the same this is a friggin just this kind of a molasses psychedelic experience we're having right now right yeah. so it's a little slower you know it might be a little less colorful but it's the same <laughs> basic concept so it's not really what i'm looking for you know I, in other words <laughs> to to do the same thing on steroids is is not um, is not what I'm looking for here. I'm actually looking to go underneath it, not not to to accelerate it, right? So in other words, rather than um, ra rather than go to the the next creative moment necessarily, because there will be more, they will continue in an unending stream, uh, and that's awesome. The colors will continue to blossom, right? Uh, the sun will rise and set. The, the 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 days will glow bright or dim on a on a mood. Uh, but underneath that is uh, uh, to my um, I anticipate that underneath that is something um, steady. Hmm. That uh, that is um, the a say, source hmm. of the um, the dull and the color, the uh, the love and the hate. So. Uh, the connective tissue and the stuff it wraps. Yeah. Um, you see, the cadavers have taught me this <laughs> uh, because you go in looking for parts and you come up with connection. If you're paying attention, right. it's very possible to not pay attention, cut it up into the pieces you already know, and congratulate yourself. Yeah. But if you actually go in there and, and remember that every time you apply your scalpel to the tissue, you've... Uh, undone it and you hang with what you undid rather than what you've done then you go to the whole thing rather than the part hmm. and I want to do that with the whole world not just the cadaver hmm. right so by by um, <laughs> by uh, extension let's say if I've found the connections within the body then I have to I have to retrace my steps and ask myself, what is the body after all? It does it end at the skin? At the, because there's something subtle past the skin. I can feel it. I can see it, actually. And so there's something past the skin. And I know if we stood close to each other, electrons would jump back and forth between us and that there's a continuum, not only of the material world, but maybe that of even consciousness. So, and that continuum that appears to be filled with parts uh, may be continuous, just like I found everything inside the body to be. Why wouldn't it be? As above, so below. It's it's continuous. And so I have to really ask myself, who am I kidding here, convincing myself that I am this body and you are that one? 
Uh, it's not it's not as convincing uh, an illusion as as it used to be. I'm not saying I've I've suddenly gone into whatever uh, some other mode and see that. I'm just I'm suspicious now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. I wondered, uh, as far as a tangible like connective tissue type question, something. Um, I think our relationship to, like right now in, in this book, I'm, I'm talking about like the, the power of hanging and the value of hanging. And, and this book? Oh, I don't know. that I, I, I thought I thought I'd kind of mentioned you already. So I'm doing a book. Um, it's broken down into essentially kind of like how 100% of our life is movement. You know, so we isolate ourselves into like, I'm at the gym doing exercise, I'm at yoga, but we don't think about like how I take a poop or how I drink tea or how I'm sitting here talking to you. Like mm-hmm. right now we're fitnessing. And so it's kind of like a user's manual on physical inhabitants. Nice. And it gets into some other stuff too. How music affects you. This is, you know, how looking out to the distance affects you. Everything, literally everything that you can kind of reach out and grab or think about is some form of movement. And we can start to harness all of that. I'm, I'm totally, uh, I'm totally with you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but one of those, one of the things in there that I'd be curious your perspective is the the aliveness of um, calloused skin. You know, and so when we think of, or just your, your, your perspective on the value of like strengthening our skin is actually, you know, like a, a part of the kinetic chain of movement. If so, we have weak skin, but we have these huge honking muscles that can pull and, but the skin can't support that, then it's a, it's a broken system. You know, so I wonder from your perspective, like back on physical, tangible body, you know, and maybe, you know, beyond that, um, like what is a callus? Um, you know, building layers of squamous epithelium, just like, uh, haven't sloughed off yet and super useful. Uh, we don't, I, I think it's a neat, uh, question. And, and if I remember, I love the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. I read them to my children several times. She wrote the little house on the prairie series and, uh, looked up images of the actual people. And uh, her husband, Almanzo, you know, a farmer, farmer boy, the book was written about Almanzo, uh, as a man, as an old man, his hands were like a silverback gorilla. I mean, he had, he had mitts. They were huge, thick-fingered, calloused hands. He wasn't born with those puppies, right? He grew them. He used them into, into that form. I had a guy take my class uh, last summer. His feet were like this. The dude was one of these barefoot dudes, barefoot runner, barefoot marathoner. He had feet like Almanzo's hands. His toes were thick. He had robustly healthy feet, in yeah. my opinion, um, that w- were grown to support his movement, as you say. Now, frankly, I don't want the callus that's on my dick uh, because that one doesn't belong there. You know what I'm saying? In other words, when you circumcise somebody and take their skin away, you get a callus on the glands, right? right? But that one doesn't belong there. It doesn't fit the function, right? The function is sensitivity, not callousness. So we end up with a callous male culture. Um, Something's wrong there, right? But the hands and the feet, awesome. Hmm. It's interesting. It's an interesting idea, like the how we kind of set males up in this case, but but women across the world. I think like, do you know the story of Kellogg? And he used to he oh, like yeah. Kell- Kellogg's cornflakes. He was like a really oh, sadistic yeah. person, and his he would he would he recommended pouring. I think it was like carbolic acid or something terrible on women's uh, clits, clitoris. Um, to yeah. desensitize it because of like the sensation of pleasure well, is like this is was devilish. the Victorian theme, and it and it arrived long before Victoria. The the Methodist moralizers, the tent preachers who came to this country in the 1800s, even uh, I'm sorry, in the in the 18th century, so late 1700s, 1800s, early 1800s, were preaching, um, you know, the Great Awakening, or whatever. This was uh, they were preaching circumcision as a cure for lust and masturbation. Right. So as though it's a bad thing. Didn't work. Yeah. Um, all, yeah. So there's um, and we look around the world and of course we're all ju- justly and rightly horrified by female circumcision. But oddly enough, horror at male circumcision has not caught on yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> right? In other words, it sort of tickles our funny bone. We think, oh, it's a, it's a little bit of skin. What's that? Or we think of a little baby's penis as like a kind of a cute little thing. And what could, what, what, what harm would it be to take off a little bit of skin, which ends up being 30 to 50 percent of the shaft of the penis and changes the structure of the sexual act completely. Hmm. So you, you coitus will never be the same again because the design is that the vagina is pressure sensitive and that the penis is friction loving so it has friction within its own skin while pressing against the walls of the vagina not abrading them and so if you if you take away the skin that was there to accommodate the erectile tissue when erect then you end up with a taut wrapping of the penis resulting in abrasion rather than self gliding that's a completely different mechanics of sex that we've created on top of the fact that the foreskin is um, and it is is part of our immune system, right? And not not to mention it's the most erogenous zone of the penis that's been removed, and that was intentional by those Protestant moralists. And what we do today in a hospital was what they were advocating, not Jewish circumcision, where you have the mark of circumcision done by a moil and you take out, you know, a, a little bit, and the glands is slightly exposed, and if you see. Uh, orthodox men in a spa, you'll notice they have more foreskin than your average uh, goy who got uh, cut at a hospital through what's called the stripping of the glands, which is the Protestant <laughs> invented procedure. Well, actually, the rabbis invented it back in the time of the Romans when they were, um, you know, wanting to play in the games, but they had been circumcised, so Jewish men have been uncircumcising themselves since the dawn of time. Uh, or at least the dawn of circumcision, and they were like, "Oh, we gotta, we gotta stop that." So we did a more extreme procedure, which then fell out of favor and was re revivified by the Protestant moralizers as a means of basically limiting the erogenous experience and, and by taking away its the actual tissue, making making it gone. Uh, Do you think there could be some? I mean, it would seem like the answer would have to be yes, but um, some like base level contraction that we're kind of setting up the, the organism, the, the baby, the child oh, with? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> imagine, imagine a being that has no real cognitive abilities. It has its, its, cer cer its cerebrum. It doesn't even have like dents in it yet. You know what I'm saying? It ain't thinking about things. It's just like a, a pulsing feeling, love being, a little, little, little arm full of fat. And, uh, and skin, and we go and betray it in the most egregious manner by in an anesthetized surgery, removing the most sensitive tissue of the form, leaving them scarred and screaming at two days old after their vitamin K shot to keep them from bleeding out to death. At least the Jewish community waits eight days. Hmm. What do you think the impact of that would be psychologically? And, oh, and, how, and how would one unwind that? Oh, well, the impact first is, is grief and anger. Grief and anger. Like, I mean, we've gone from the womb to hell in a moment. What grief. And, and how. And the pa and pain. Go, go from softness and luxury to pain forget about the brightness of the room any of that crap that's nothing now let's put a knife to you now if i put a knife to you now it would hurt like the bejesus right it wasn't any different then in fact it was worse because you you it was all you had was feeling right uh and so the the setup mm. is is to have people who are um angry and callous in their genitals welcome to the rape culture Welcome to the porn culture. Welcome to the culture that, simul that splits itself around sexuality and cuts itself off from the bottom half of its body. Uh, who wants to think about that? Hmm. Uh, who wants to feel that? And so we actually have forced people to have a, a, a mechanics of sex that's more demanding to generate pleasure because of the callous glands, right, and the lack of you know, self-lubricant of the skin over the glands in the sex act, right? So you got to work harder. Now you're banging away, trying to get your thing off instead of connecting. Like, it's just so twisted, I can't even tell you. Yeah. So, um, so, what, so then what does that do to the whole organism? It just, America! <laughs> I mean, it's, 
it's our it's our <laughs> culture, you know. In other words, and we can heal it too. I mean, we can heal it. We can heal anything. I mean, it's very easy to heal out and stop doing it. Um, and a couple generations will go by, and we'll soften up a little bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, meanwhile, as people like me who are restorers, yes, it is possible. Like I said, since since the dawn of circumcision, people have been uncircumcising themselves. So. I'm in, I'm in for that party. What does that mean, uncircumcising yourself? Well, you've seen, you've grown, right? You were a boy and you were a little guy and now you're a big guy, right? And your skin, you, you, you didn't tear, tear through it, right? Skin stretches, right? It has stretch receptors and it stretches when it's stretched and when it's stretched, new skin cells grow, skin cells grow and more skin is there now. Whoa. So, um, the, like, right, how does a woman's, a uh, pregnant woman's breast enlarge without bursting through the skin. It doesn't. The skin stretches and more skin grows, right? It's, not a, it's a miracle. It's, it's amazing. We are amazing. So the thing is, this, this, this property of skin stretching and growing doesn't change. That's Just look at folks who are growing in their middle section, right? It's like the skin accommodates. It's not like uh, it bursts through. So same thing with, uh, with the, uh, the uh, pars intima as I like to call them, the, that intimate aspect of our body, um, which if you hang with it long enough is the whole body, but let's just start with the genitals, as they're commonly understood, yeah. and say that you can, um, you can manually place a stretch on the skin Whoa. of the shaft of the penis in order to uh, create more skin. Um, so, you know, if you're circumcised and they did a, good job, meaning they took away your skin, then you have a tight erection, and, uh, and that is a problem. <laughs> if you note on such a, such a penis that the hair is being dragged up from the pubic area, right? it's being dragged halfway up the shaft of the penis to cover that erectile tissue. Huh. You see, it used to be covered by skin that wasn't hairy, but now you've got like a hairy penis that you're putting in a woman. That's even more of trouble, right? So put, put that thing away and grow yourself some skin. Um, she'll thank you for it, uh, for he or whoever. I'm not opposed to the mangina, you know what I'm saying? So, but all I'm saying is that... Um, so you, like you, hang can, a, you hang a weight from it or something? Sorry? Do you hang a weight from your non-foreskin, foreskin to uh, be? That's no way to start if you don't have much... Because there's nothing to gather. In other words, the, the there are many devices out there. Wow, I know idea. Uh, and the devices uh, have various ways of creating a grip and a stretch at the same time. And uh, huh. uh, but if you're starting out, which most people are, because they've never heard of such a thing, um, you have to do kind of like say, say you got a a circum to some circumferential hands pulling in opposite directions and creating a tension on the skin and then hold that stretch for a while and go to a different place and hold that stretch for a while and go to a different place and hold that stretch for a while and do that for 20 minutes a day for uh, a few months and you'll already have kind of play in the tissue that wasn't there before do it for several years and it all depends on where you start. So you can have like an index of of cut severity placed against an index of time, right? So the most severe cut is going to take a whole lot more time to uh, you know to recover that amount of skin. Not to mention if you happen to be having some kind of uh, non-average endowment, then there's that much more skin you're going to have to create in order to uh, cover that tissue mm. right so but you there's no end to it i mean you can have it down to your ankle if you want uh, <laughs> i don't i don't recommend it you know there's good better and uh, it's like one too many mints after dinner yeah right i, I, I do that with mint with uh, these cinnamon toothpicks i go, I go yeah, if you can throw it over your shoulder like a military <laughs> soldier you've gone too far yeah. but chances are you will be bored out of your mind long before that. Right, yeah, I get that. Um, I wonder your perspective on what uh, stiffness and tension is in the body. And it's like a huge question that you could go any which direction with, but like 
So, so one example would be like, I, I, I'm curious of like how shame creates contraction in the body, for example. Someone that's ashamed of their genitals or their anus or any of that. But there's Absolutely. any direction you could go with it. Like what is, to, we think of it as more as like foam roll, myofascial release. Like it's just a musculoskeletal, you know, m machine thing. Well, you can sneak in there that, that way, but then you find, why am I bawling while I'm foam rolling? Why have I suddenly burst into tears, right? You know, because it's not because it hurts so bad. It's because it actually, it actually snuck into the whole organism right. when you least expected it. But, I mean, Wilhelm Reich was all about, you know, that, the, uh, ex that expansion, contraction um, cycle, you know, of the whole organism. You know, you poke a little paramecium is going to contract and it's naturally pulsing life pulses right so there's a natural pulsation to the whole organism to the whole planet to the cells within the organism you know to the cycles of of the organism so uh, absolutely fear contracts us love expands us yeah. And and, um, and if we're chronically contracted or chronically intending to contract ourselves, <laughs> right? If uh, what are you expressing? You know, yeah. ultimately, I know what I was expressing when I was doing that kind of thing. I was pissed off and unconscious of it. And armoring. Yeah, Pot exactly. Poten potentially. I, exactly. I was trying to armor myself, literally. Yeah. It worked pretty well. I was kind of buff at one time. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm just kind of a rail thin monk. <laughs> so, it's probably more efficient to live inside that body. Which one? This one? Yeah. Well, it's less time consuming in terms of maintenance. <laughs> that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just less demanding, you know, for your whole system to, to be yeah, regulating. Yeah, I spend whole weeks at a time wanting to throw up because I turned my legs into rip noodles watching them grow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that too. Um, so, so that, yeah, you can see stiffness in the body with working with the cadaver, yeah? No. no. Actually, it's very deceptive that way. Oh, really? Um, right, because two, two problems. Um, in the fixed body, well, it, fixed, right? We we're talking about movement, right? So fixed is like the opposite of movement. So on top of being dead, you're cooked, right? So the, the tissue is cooked chemically in, in a way that um, it's stiff, but it's not stiff because of anything that person did. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's stiff because of a, a treatment. Now, if we have an unfixed body, I like to call them unfixed rather than fresh because I've never spotted one that I would pick up at the supermarket and fresh. You know what I'm saying? They all yeah. look past due to me, but uh, I say that lovingly. Um, yeah. But the, the, um, the, the unfixed tissue uh, is hypermobile. There's no stiffness to be found. It's like a puddle. If it weren't for the other tissues, it would just go flat. You know, and if it weren't for the, the, the tension in the skin, you know, everything would just, you know, it goes to, it wants to go to a level desperately. And as you work, but, and so that's an exaggeration of of this of the character of the tissue so it's similar when you're in an anesthetized if you're anesthetized also the, the tone is gone it's very dangerous to move someone you know, right. dislocate their joints right so similarly with the unfixed body um you you know there's no tension there either so so i can see um the, the, really, the kind of shortness that people w wish they could find there they tend not to that that having been said you can see what's been set up in the bones right so soft tissues have been modeling the bones for 80 years and that's that doesn't go away whether you're embalmed or unfixed hmm. so the the, the, ch the transformation of the bones remains uh, and and so that gives you a clue to the tensional patterns that were in soft tissues that you can't really trace the same way anymore. Mm. Uh, and we can unwind those those tension patterns in the in the, the living moving body. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think there's a thousand ways to skin that cat. Yeah. You know, so people pick their favorite ways and then try and argue for them. I think they're wasting their time uh, because there's a lot of ways to do it. 
Um, I used to, whatever, work on people's bodies. And then I was like, started like talking to people and found out I could make so much better progress by talking to people in a, right. you know, in, in a way that, that got in, that got in past defenses. Working with the body kind of, oh, it's like a Trojan horse though. It can be. You can have a lot of different forms of Trojan horse, but I think that that, that container that you have softening someone, working with their you know, enteric nerve, their guts and getting them to just really calm down, feeling into their breath, it's almost like, um, like a hypnotic state. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And um, I think also people spend a lot of time in, in body work, depending upon their approach, um, working on the tension that's created by their relationship. So a person comes in and they want to show they can take it. So they'll generate an armor for the moment. Or they want to show that they're stronger than you, so they'll resist your touch. Uh, or, or they want to be overpowered. They get off on being overpowered. So they'll put up a fight and then relinquish. And then that little cycle will go through each session and people will think they're doing something that's worth maybe or $100. Um, I'm not so sure. Uh, the arm wrestling is worth that much money. Um, and then who the heck am I to decide how much tension should be in someone's body? Maybe they have the exact amount of tension it takes to endure their miserable alcoholic husband who's going to come home that night and threaten them. Right. So, you know, and, and I can get them all loosey-goosey. And he'll fucking think she just had sex and punch her in the head, you know. So, you know, there, there. Did you do her a favor, you know? Or so, you know what I'm saying? Or I, we could provide other examples. I don't know where that one came from. Uh, it's terrible, uh, but I'm just saying that w we don't know what a person's life is. We, that w the presumption when someone comes in is they want some thing, help. They want or improvement or to get away from pain or to move towards pleasure or to whatever, expand as a human being or maybe just to do better at their sport or what have you. I mean, people come in with different goals, um, but when, you, when you're tinkering around in there with your own idea of what they ought to be, and don't tell me you don't have one, because uh, uh, <laughs> in other words, we, we tend to do that, you know, we're thinking, we're not judgmental, we're here for you, you know, it's like, yeah, we're here for you and hoping you'll like stop doing this and start doing that and be shaped a little more this way than that and move a little more this way than that. Hmm. And we don't even inspect our incredible judgment. And, and, hmm. and then again, people will come to you because they, whatever, you go to an interior decorator hoping they'll give you good ideas for your house. So there ain't nothing wrong with that, you know, just as long as it's above board. It's almost like that, like the lack of acceptance of who you are when you come out of the womb and you get circumcised. It's almost like that initial, you know, you come out trusting the world and then, well, bam. It's almost like a similar relationship with seeing certain, maybe like, a, you know, whatever, manual therapist or whatever relationship where it's like you're coming in and, and maybe at a deeper level what your nervous system, your subconscious is seeking is, is full acceptance to allow yourself mm. to kind of go whichever direction you need to. Mm. But instead, it's kind of almost like it's like a it's like a meta circumcision. <laughs> You're like, I'll cut you again. I, that's very insightful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and people try and uh, you know put themselves together for the therapist, like they do for the mirror, mirror on the wall. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Uh, that was you know, that came up a lot in our discussions around taking pictures and standing in front of your you know your offer or whatever. Cause, uh, I dropped that out of my practice quickly. You know, I was like, this is not for me. I found, um, I, I found doing um, a uh, Vipassana meditation thing, like a 10 day sit, I found more change in my connective tissue from doing absolutely nothing and just like sitting and kind of fizzling with myself than mm -hmm. almost any rolfing or body work mm -hmm. or almost anything that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marvin Solit. You probably have not heard that name. He was no. a very interesting guy. He was one. Of, remember, Ida Roth taught a bunch of osteopaths in the fifties, 
And this guy, Marvin Solit, was one of them. I don't know how I met Marvin, but I met him in Boston where I taught for about 16 years in a lab at Tufts there. And Marvin lived in Cambridge, and he was just a really cool guy. And um, he was an elder gentleman, and, uh, and he had developed a therapy, <laughs> basically, that consisted in standing, uh, just standing there. And other people would uh, accompany you while you stood there. And if you, after a while, you couldn't stand there, <laughs> right? And you'd move. And the idea would be that you'd sort of follow rather than guide the movement intentionally. And people would sort of just unwind themselves in a public display of letting go. Um, hmm. that, that was powerfully transformative. Um, and uh, try it someday. Try and just sort of stand there and see what happens. You know, like soldiers. You know how much work it takes for a soldier to stand at attention? Yeah. Because the body does, rails against that in, in every way. Yeah. Uh, I used to hold the ball, you know, in, uh, in uh, Qigong practice. I was a Tai Chi guy for years back in my graduate school days. And, you know, we hold the ball for an hour. Uh, you know, just with and the, the 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 mental challenge of that, no less the physical, was amazing. It seems like it like allows you to go into different layers of your own onion in a way. Like I don't know if you've ever done any. I mean, you lived in Boulder, I think, right? So you've probably done like eye gazing and some new age stuff like that, where you like just <laughs> stare at somebody for ten, fifteen minutes and kind of see what <laughs> happens. We're kind of doing it right now. Yeah, uh, I, I try. <laughs> Try not to. Uh, well, whatever. Know, yeah. Whatever. Just for the sake of the example. But it, yeah, in, yeah. in doing that, you literally, I mean, maybe not every, but whatever. You see whatever you see. But you can see the different layers of themselves. You'll go through it. And so you start off, like persona means it's like a, it's like a Latin word for through sound, which is like these masks that Greco-Roman theater people used to wear to project the sound out. So like your persona, that face, your person is kind of that superficial layer. And so I, I kind of have a, a, a suspicion that a lot of these tensional patterns in our body is kind of us, they're just us being wrapped up in that persona. But if you can step behind that a little bit, all of a sudden you can get into the part that actually heals you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you, were, you came to my talk in uh, LA. Yeah. And I know I gave some some stories about um, basically how our, let's say our persona, since you use the word and I, I like it, um, then also has like kind of a, a whole body characteristic um, tensional patterns and movement patterns, limit cycles on those differential movement within the tissues that are going to set you up to be sort of slippy slidey in some areas of your body and gummy gluey in others. Uh, and eventually we, we can succumb to these patterns. And as they, as they sort of um, thingify with age, you know, and, and turn the, the, that which was life into a death mask of the persona, right? Then, then, um, then to, well, as you say, if you, if you can find a way to peel, peel, mat, peel that back and um, allow the, the organic movement to express through the tissues as it will, as it will, because life is going to move you. You don't need a persona to move, right? In other words, you don't have a choice. Life will move you. It will move your bowels. It will move your lungs. Wow. Uh, we are, uh, according to many really interesting, brilliant people, um, uh, automatons, you know what I'm saying? And we humor ourselves uh, otherwise, now I, I'm not holding this idea as my own. Uh, I'm telling you that people like uh, um, you know, Ger Gergiev or Nikola Tesla, for that matter, you know, believe that we were basically automatons. Um, and what does automaton mean? Uh, like kind of operating on automatic. We don't have free will. Yeah. You know that. In other words, do you really have free will about shitting? or breathing let's just start with those you know not really you know you can hold off i mean protestants did uh <laughs> you know in other words the people who who plowed the prairies and had an outhouse outside you know and there was a blizzard that was a week long they did shit for a week 
And when they did, they had to like go out as a family on a rope, you know, and they <laughs> like, God, and that was like every week, whether you liked it or not, we're going to go out into that weather. Hmm. Um, so, you know, there's what we can do to ourselves is, is, is different from what, what would normally express through us. You know, hmm. me and my dog shit three times a day, no problem. <laughs> She, she shifts more than me now. I don't know how. She only weighs like 17 pounds. But she, somehow she shifts amazing, amazingly. In relation to the automat automaton thing, I heard uh, yesterday, I learned that bug is like an old Celtic word for um, ghost or goblin. And we have like something like 100 trillion different bugs inside of our, our guts. And so, and then there's a lot of different, you know, there's a thing called toxoplasmosis and various different like parasites that kind of like brainwash, control the, the organism. Mm. And so it's kind of an interesting, as you're saying that, it's just an interesting thing. Like the, these, these, this bacteria, these bugs inside of us, that, that, that word comes from ghost. It's like the ghost inside mm. that's kind of operating. It's like who's in control ghost of this in thing? A ghost in the machine. Yeah. And we humor ourselves. The machine, right. We humor ourselves that our personhood is all important and that it's in charge, and this is uh, possibly false. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. You know, espe especially if you're reaching for one more drink or can't stop until that box of cookies is done. Yeah. Is that, is that your person, or is that the crew? You know? Yeah. It seems like uh, it's all about creating relationships, just like any, anything. It's like, can you come into a relationship with your ego and your and your ghosts and your, you know, and your wife and your job and your country yeah. and your earth yeah. and your extended. Yeah. And what's, know. and what's underneath it all. And, and are we sharing one life, you know, maybe, I don't know, one yeah. being, one being, you know, and that it looks through many cilia or whatever, you know, I mean, and what do they know? Silly or waving around inside your test and looking at each other, being like, wow, we packed the house. <laughs> you know? Do you have a sense of what pain is in the body? Yeah, it's right here. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get you sitting on the floor, Gil. What are you doing? Oh, Lord of mercy. I'm so uncomfortable in front of this computer screen. I can't tell you. Why don't you sit on the floor? That's a big part of what the book is about. <laughs> that's a big part. That's like if there's one thing that I give a darn about in this Because I'm, I'm tethered to this fucking computer with these I am. I am too. I'm on the floor, Gil. I mean, not well, to say so, what I'm doing is like the superior way, but so I think it's the superior we, way. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> wave, so, um, wave your silly at Gil. <laughs> It's only one cilia I'm going to wave here. <laughs> Are you stretching out your cilia? Are you stretching out your, your junk? Your, um, your penis? Not, not at the moment. Not at the moment. <laughs> a little earlier. A little earlier. Did you, so you're actually practicing that? Are you like okay to talking about that? I mean, I talk about like some interesting things here, but is that... I, I wish more people would talk about it. I wish oh, more good. people Perfect. would right. reclaim their, their, their endowment. And, 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 um, only because, uh, I wouldn't be so lonely. No, uh, so, uh, we can uh, trade we, pictures. Well, actually, uh, just go out there. There's huge, there's all kinds of groups, uh, Damn. uh in tactivist organizations, men's groups that, that actually are, are there already. So this is not um, a, a tiny uh, minority. Wow. Um, there are lots, lots of people, and as I've talked about it in class, I meet guys who either you know start r restoring their endowment or or guys who already have. Um, that's how I got got. Uh, I talked about it because I, I I've been speaking on circumcision for 25 years, and people will step up and say, "Hey, uh, you know, I I restored my." my uh, foreskin mm. and I was like that's cool uh, so I looked into it and then crazy um, you know eventually took it up there, there's many different methods um, but it, again depending upon sort of your index cut you'll you'll have to start manually uh, before you can use tools really uh, you know or of course implements or something you know um, 
because they just when you don't have enough skin to to stretch. You know, there's nothing there. You gotta have skin to stretch the skin. Are, so are, have you come up with a, a working definition of pain? I ask a lot of people this. Oh yeah, pain. No, I mean for, uh, no. I mean, <laughs> right. Pain is uh, ouch. Yeah. So pain is very relative, right? I am maybe an expert in pain, actually, um, <laughs> from my own personal experience. Um, I have experienced um, extraordinary pain, and uh, I've, I've had decades of pain. Um, nothing like what I've had in the last uh, eight years. But um, the uh, so I, for having experienced really intense pain, um, it can be uh, you know a signal. It can also be a a mistaken signal. Right. Right. So that really sucks because then you like get nothing for it. You know, you've got a mistaken pain signal, so you're just suffering with no, and there's nothing to do about it. My uncle was seven years; he couldn't wear a shirt before he died. He had post-herpetic neuralgia, uh, which is to say, you get shingles as an elderly person. And then a certain small percentage of elderly people who have shingles uh, uh, will then, um, the, the pain never leaves. It, 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 it moves in and the signal becomes permanent. Hmm. And so he couldn't wear a shirt because his back stung, you know. Uh, so we actually made him like front shirts and cut the back out for him. Um, but uh, that's actually a leading cause of suicide in the elderly is shingles, post herpetic neuralgia. Wow. Um, but in, in, uh, it, from, in my case, uh, it's a, whatever, it's also a useless pain. So that was an example of pain that it doesn't matter. It's a misfired signal. Uh, that's also true in cl uh, cluster headaches, which I have, uh, that's my diagnosis. So, oh, sure. um, cl cluster, cluster headaches are, um, also you're getting, uh, an un, Fucking believable, <laughs> intense pain signal. Wow! But you don't get to die from it, and that's the, the the mean part about it. So it's like, in other words, okay, fine. I'm being broken, being run over by a tractor. Uh, eventually, it's gonna stop, right? You're gonna, you know. Well, this this one also goes away, but it's more like it's more akin to the parallel is torture. For some, like pain, you, torture is useless pain, right? In other words. It's a kind of pain that has no purpose. It's not giving you information. If you correct this behavior, it'll go away. Yeah. Like, torture is just like, just mean. Um, and, and, and so some kinds of pain are utterly useless, uh, and other kinds of pain are, are really important. You know, so if you, you know, Maybe you've got a stomach ache and you're rich. Well, thank goodness you're maybe ejecting toxins or something, right? That's that. So it can be painful to throw up, but it can also be the, the purgative process can be really important. Um, or if you're exceeding, right. you know, the stress capacities of your musculature in some activity and you ignore it, you're going to break something. Um, you know, tissues become inflamed. It's like rest it or help it you know so pain is also just like a crying child to me yeah. you know is and I've, i'm a dad i have i raised three children homeschooled them and they they all oh, see a lot of pain little kids are in pain every other minute they're always tripping or falling or banging their head on something or pulling each other's hair god knows what they're doing so you, you know this pain is a constant part of the environment and it can signal misbehavior. It can signal um, uncoordination. It can it can signal danger. Uh, you know, um, so it's a pretty complicated phenomenon. Pain. I wouldn't want to put it in one box, really, huh? And um, and then whatever. I grew up in the '70s when pain means gain, right? So right. I, I, I I sought pain. You know, pain was my was a different signal. Pain was a positive signal under that condition, right? Completely flipped pain. I made pain the thing I was trying to get to tell me I was succeeding in my exercises. Right now I'm in pain. Ta-da! Good. That means I'm going to grow. I had a higher purpose. The higher purpose was 
big guns, you know. I wanted to, I want to have big muscles and, and you know, I wanted to look like Frank Zane. He was my hero, you know. Yeah. Uh, so Frank Zane was the little Mr. Olympia. You know, he was 5'10 and 180 pounds and cut to ribbons, and I thought he was really cool um, at, when I was 17 or 16 years old, right? And he was doing his thing with Arnold and Franco Colombo and all those people. So, um, you know, pain, pain was uh, something I actively sought to prove my progress. Um, I ain't selling that anymore, but I'm just telling you, that was, that's a mindset yeah. also about pain. I haven't read any books on pain or anything. Mm. I just have my own pain journey. I think pain, um, pain could potentially be like a state change. Like if you look in like like um, sun dance ceremonies and things like that, where they're like piercing their bodies and mm. dancing without any food or whatever around the tree in the heat, and it gets you to a like a like a breaking point. Whereas yeah. for some people, like the, the ego, that persona maybe is stronger with them, and so it takes a lot to get through until finally it it says okay, like. And that's that's a big part of what like extended meditations are all about. I, I think I don't really know, but you know it gets to that point where if you just sit with that, that's what Guenka he went he started the whole meditation thing for headaches. He saw sought out every major doctor, all the science, like everything for headaches for years and years and years. Finally, he did this ten day sit thing, and um, I don't know if it was the first one, but it might have been the first one. But eventually, it like solved his whole headache thing. Mm. But it was just sitting with that and allowing it as opposed to escaping it and taking more medication or, you know, f continuing to flee. It's just like, what if we just sit with this crying child and see where it goes? Oh, I've, I've done that. And I, figured, <laughs> I figured you would have. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I'm, yeah, as I'm saying. No, it's like, I don't no know stone, what. No stone unturned. I suck the dick of the guy who invented sumatriptan. And if it's a gal, I'll do whatever she needs to. Of course, with their consent. <laughs> of course. That's really. But I'm just saying that that um, for me, after four and a half, like let's say 16 years of 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 migraines, and then four years of undiagnosed cluster headaches, yeah. I knew something was different. I knew something different was going on, but I couldn't really. I kept on thinking it was something else, like whatever. And they're and they're weird. They're very weird. They come at odd like a specific time of the night for over and over again. And then they'll and they'll be for a period of time, which period of time may grow over years. Um, and so you you, wow. you think, oh, it was two. Weeks. I had two weeks of migraines. Oh, that was really weird. Never had that before. And then you know you change your diet, change everything, and make everything wonderful, and it's gone. And then boom, it comes back despite all the change. And you're like, oh, it's because I ate that cookie. Right. You know. And then you go and, and you have another cluster, and you suffer through that. And then you think, oh, well, it went away. I must what I, my changes must have worked again this time. Or oh, it was that that stretching, or that it was my bone was out of place. So I saw the chiropractor, and you make every you'll you'll attribute causation to cessation to anything that happened temporarily near tempor, temporarily near the the shift of the moment but i literally had the headache go away while putting my pants on on the way to the hospital and it's just because i was like ready to walk out on a highway and die and then it was gone and it's like wow it's it's no different than whatever it's like we take the needle out from under your fingernail and it just doesn't hurt that bad anymore so it's a strange thing and 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 I, I, you know, to meditate, you, can you meditate your way through a cluster headache? I guess that's what I did for those four and a half years. Um, but I, it really was, it, it was very uh, unproductive pain. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Uh, I eventually decided I love myself enough to take a pill. Right, yeah. Um, you probably need to, we're probably past the, the, our, our scheduled scheduled non-scheduled timing here you probably I don't know uh, did you did you get what you were looking for here uh, yeah I'm not looking for anything I like huh. I, yeah that was <laughs> what we I mean we're still recording this is exactly what I'm looking not looking for oh good awesome. <laughs> well that, that was easy yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the one one question that I actually was curious um I have a feeling I'm gonna I already know the the answer but maybe not it is um, actually, I don't think I have any idea what the answer is on this, but do you see any tissue variants between different cultures, religions, um, people from around the globe, or is a body a body a body? A body a body is not a body. Okay. And 
I um, work with a very homogenous, relatively homogenous pool of donors, right? Because I'm going to a few different locations and drawing on those donor populations, which are basically elderly Caucasians. Right. That's who's given their body away, body away in uh, northern New Jersey and San Francisco and Texas. Colorado, anywhere where I've worked, it's always the same. The certain cultures don't like to give their bodies away so much. Oh, right. right? It's, it's not, it's culturally offensive or unlikely. And so you end up not seeing as much variety as there is in, on the planet in the lab, which is unfortunate. Because um, just look around, the, the variation is, is obvious. There's gene pools on this planet that aren't as, as, uh, as homogenous as others, and um, you know, we got to go to the physical anthropologist for that. That was going to be my major in college. I ended up being an ethics major, a religion major. Kind of went from physical to cultural anthropology, and then from cultural anthropology to study of religion, and then from study of religion to ethics, uh, and got my PhD in that. But then came back around to the physical anthropology in the form of golly, look at me! I teach anatomy in gross labs, so. Yeah. Um, the, the, I have a lot of respect for the anthropologists because they pay attention in detail and they do get to sample a much wider variety than I do because they're digging this stuff up all over, yeah. all over the planet, right? You're essentially like describing why following most statistics and studies and such are, it's challenging because it's coming from, usually from like some pool of like college students that want to make $45 or something. It doesn't necessarily relate to you in any way. But nonetheless, you it, apply. it does because I was that poor college student. Right. Well, maybe really the forty-five dollars. So I'm in that study. Buddy. <laughs> I I took every every time I saw one of those pieces of paper with the little strips at the bottom and a phone number. I said, I will inject you with, make you sit still for, paint you this color. I was there. Yeah, me too. Yeah, in Boulder, <laughs> in Boulder Colorado, I lived near CU. I would do the same thing. Uh, well, cool, man. Um, thanks so much. I, I like, I've been following along your stuff since I went to the Rolf Institute, which isn't like even something I talk about on this podcast very much, but I've been following your stuff since, um, since then and really appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate your message. Thank um, you. Thanks for, thanks for the chat. I appreciate your interest. Yeah, of course. What, uh, what's the best, uh, direction to point people? What's like the, where should people go for, for um, learn, learn more? www.gilhadley.com. Perfect. Cool. Is there anything stand out? You that, can misspell that on Google, by the way, and they'll send you there anyway. <laughs> is there anything that would be like a standout thing of point of interest for people to, I don't know, some type of, I don't know, workshop coming up or some type of anything? Um, or something just, you know, doesn't need to be a workshop. Oh, I got my dissection schedule up there, and I got some cool online courses now that I didn't have last time I talked to you. Awesome. So I'm excited about that. You know, I did do a year-long fuzz tour since I, I, you know, since we spoke in the podcast last time. That was uh, 20,000 miles, 46 cities, and, and a lot of time in a camper at Love's Truck Stops. But um, So I did record those, and, and now I have a, a nice, uh, like a five-hour continuing ed course on the site based on that, which I think is wow. really worthwhile. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm also excited about Bruce's movie, our our fellow friend Bruce, uh, he he he's got his. Um, Is it out officially? No, not officially, but I, okay. I, it's screening still, and he just keeps improving it, and it's Good. it's it's. I'm thrilled to watch the trajectory of its development, and he just keep, he was at the Fashion Congress. He interviewed a whole bunch more people. Cool. It's just it's just getting richer and more interesting. So I'm happy to be a part of that as well. I gave him all my footage. He's the only person on the planet I've ever trusted with all my footage, uh, and and just for anyone who heard that. He will remain the only person I ever trust with all my footage, because uh, I, I, his intent is is clean and and uh, and I'm, I'm I'm excited about what he's creating. Cool. That's Bruce Schoenfield. What was what is what's it called? Like the yeah. What was it called? The Secret Life of Fashion. Secret there's Life nice, of Fashion. Yeah. yeah. Look for the, there's a nice trailer. Uh, nice trailer online, but uh, I have um, you know contributed footage to it and uh, and uh, so a little bit of interview stuff, and I'm, I'm excited for him. Cool. And for it. I'm excited for all of us. This is a nice documentary. Cool. Yeah, I went to one of the showings or whatever you'd call it um, 
probably six months ago, so I'm excited to see it. All right. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I will, I, and I probably have like some specific questions if you're open to it. I think I asked you if you're open to being um, like featured or involved in the, the actual book. Um, I think that'd be awesome. It's, there's all sorts of interesting people. Wim Hof's in there, you know, like Jill Miller is Kelly Starrett and Larry oh, Hamilton, cool. nice a whole, you. whole interesting crew of people are kind of gathering their perspectives on things. So we can sort that out if you're open to it. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I will, uh, look at that arm and, re- and recording. I know I'm a, Just I'm a, doing your spare time. I'm a breakiating ape. There's a chapter in there about hanging. You only, you only move. Like with steel bars in your hands? No, no, I mostly do acrobatic stuff. So my thing is like, oh, because oh, oh, I like pick people up over my head and I like swing them around. Like you're and, like a circus strongman. Kind of. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like have an affair with being like a acrobatic kind of like flying individual. But I'm, I'm not. That's not my thing. But that's, that's what I secretly desire. Um, cool. Yeah, so I'm 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 more into like dance and like the, been into a lot of martial arts stuff, and then I like yoga. I'm taking my yoga teacher certification thing in the next month or so. So I'm just curious about how to gain a relationship with everything. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks thanks for asking. That was a long winded explanation. All right, cool. Recording recording's over. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we got a couple things to help support that body of yours, one of which is the Align Band that people have been really loving, which I'm super grateful for. Um, it is a heavy-duty resistance band, comes along with a door anchor, traveling case, and then a online video guide on how to use that thing. It's my absolute go-to travel tool. I've got it hanging literally from my door right beside me now. Um, use it regularly. Use it with clients. Uh, it can be found at alignpodcast.com slash gear uh, on Amazon. And you can also find it at Line Band on Instagram. Um, also, we finally did it. We created the Align Method online program, which focuses on unwinding the patterns of staring into technology, essentially. So forward head posture, rolled forward shoulders, rolled forward spine, kind of like just that hunchy posture thing that um, modern world is is stricken by uh, gets into how to align your physical body so self-care joint by joint from ankle to knee to hip to spine to head to neck etc really good stuff also gets into lifestyle um, gets into morning routines nighttime routines how to effectively handstand how to move on the ground Um, people have been loving that. Thank you all for grabbing it. The ones that have, and if people have any questions about that, you can reach out at align podcast on Instagram. I'm happy to support. All right. Thank you guys. Enjoy your day. Thanks for doing you. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for reviews on iTunes. That's it. Pow.